Hello, I'm Mike, I'm a postdoc at the university here, and I study organofluorine chemistry. Now I know what you're thinking, but it's not as rock and roll as the movies have led you to believe. Do we have any other chemists in tonight? No, excellent, we'll move on. <laughs> now, I thought I'd tell you good people why I got interested in chemistry in the first place. And the reason I wanted to study chemistry was that I wanted to become a superhero. <laughs> Now, in order to get superpowers from my work, I'd either have to be a very good chemist, or I'd have to be a very bad chemist. <laughs> Let me explain. If I was a very good chemist, I could devise some sort of amazing formula to give me superpowers. If I was a really bad chemist, I'd be getting in a lot of lab accidents, and I could somehow luck upon powers that way. Thinking back, I like to think that I've settled somewhere in between. You know, I haven't made any life-changing discoveries yet, but I also haven't blown anything up. Now, I've been in chemistry for over 10 years now, and neither I nor any of my friends have developed superpowers based on our work. I'm beginning to think that comic book writers just make this stuff up. I don't know, perhaps they need some sort of peer review process. Uh, Dr. Banner, we were very happy to receive your paper how gamma radiation turns me into a hulking green rage monster. <laughs> we'd love to publish your paper, but there are a few experimental details we'd like to clear up first. Uh, first of all, how much radiation is required? Secondly, is a PhD necessary for the transformation to occur? <laughs> Can we test this on more forms of life, such as undergraduates, <laughs> or at a push biologists? <laughs> One thing I've noticed is that labs don't operate the same way in real life that they do in movies. For example, I recently saw that movie, The Amazing Spider-Man, and in it, Peter Parker gets his amazing Spider-Man powers by just wandering around one of the biggest biotech companies in America and happens upon his powers. With the simplest bit of security, that film would have been 20 minutes long rather than two hours that we had to sit through. I mean, my lab here has better security than that. In each of our doors in the labs, we have this little swipe card sensor. In order to get into the labs, you have to take your staff card, wave it in front of the proximity sensor, and voila, access to the wonderful world of chemistry. Now, I keep my staff card in my wallet, which is in my front pocket, so it's easy enough just to walk up, wave my staff card in front of the sensor, and the doors unlock. However, sometimes I find that you know, I'm bringing chemicals or I'm bringing materials up from the lab. And so I've got my hands full with this box and I'm thinking, you know, I could put the box down, do it, but the floor's all the way down there. And I have to do this so many times a day. I thought, you know what? I'll see how good this sensor is. So box in hand, I sort of, I go to the sensor. It's just a little bit above hip height. So sort of get on my tiptoes. So, Nope, not work. Wave a bit more. You know? so, bigger motion, see if that works. It took me a minute or two to realise that I was giving the wall a lap dance. Like some sort of third rate chemistry stripper. What's worse? What if someone come along then? Uh, hi, Mike, is everything okay? Yeah, boss, you know, I've just picked up these chemicals, what's going well? I think you need to go speak to someone in human resources. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> the other thing I've realised as a scientist is that I can't watch movies in the same way anymore. Do you know what annoyed me most about that Spider-Man movie? Wasn't scientific inaccuracies, wasn't liberties taken with the source material, it was one scene where an extra, not even a main character, someone you're not even supposed to pay attention to, reached up with their gloves on and scratched their head. <laughs> What's in your hands? Now you put it all over your head and you've contaminated your whole body. Did they teach you nothing? <laughs> Maybe that's why no one goes to the cinema with me anymore. <laughs> that or, you know, all the grinding up against door handles. <laughs> so, thinking about why I first got into chemistry got me thinking, what would happen if I did develop superpowers based on my work? So, picture the scene. It's Friday night, five o'clock. The chemistry department lies barren like an empty wasteland. Our mild-mannered postdoc walks long into the night. Suddenly, he is bitten by a radioactive undergrad. 
He becomes St. Andrew's greatest hero. He becomes, wait for it. Keep waiting. <laughs> He becomes Flurrying Man! <laughs> now, I can all hear you asking, what sort of powers would Flurrying Man have? Well, first of all, I'm rarely found in nature, which I think you'll agree, is probably a good thing. <laughs> Secondly, one of the major components of Teflon is Flurrying. So my amazing non-stick properties mean that a fry-up would never be ruined again. Which, believe me, coming from Glasgow, we make me a god amongst the Glaswegians. <laughs> and thirdly, in my radioactive state, I can last for 109 minutes. Ladies. <laughs> hey, hey, let's just be clear. That includes your taxi ride home. I'm a superhero, not some sort of machine. <laughs> now, as I said, Teflon includes flooding. And throughout my career, a lot of people have said to me, you know, chemistry is a lot like cooking. And I suppose I can see that, but to me, chemistry has always reminded me more of sex. For example, there are many similarities between chemistry and sex. First of all, latex protection is often used. <laughs> Secondly, a lot of people buy fancy equipment or develop new techniques to try and improve the reaction. <laughs> there are also ways in that chemistry isn't like sex. For example, even if it's between consenting adults, chloroform belongs in the lab. <laughs> and secondly, you know, I've actually received praise from my chemistry skills. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> but there's one area in particular where chemistry and sex really overlap for me, and that's in column chromatography. Now, for those of you who don't know, column chromatography is a method of purifying organic compounds by using a column such as this. With silica, you run solvents through and it purifies your compounds. Now, there's three reasons that column chromatography reminds me of sex. One, alcohol is often involved. <laughs> Number two, I frequently find myself wishing for a bigger column. <laughs> and the third reason that column chromatography reminds me of sex is that I spend the vast majority of my time doing it manually in a cupboard. <laughs> Thank you.